take him back right now. Mark 8. All right. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, Jesus tests the best. He tests the best. And we're going to learn that today. He tests the best. The Lord is going to test His children. He's going to discipline them. He's going to instruct them. And He's also, in today's story, we're going to see that He tests His best. And so, we want to ask the Lord's blessing on this word. Father, we thank You today for the ministry of Your Holy Spirit. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for what You're doing in our midst. And I pray that we will learn from this word today. And that we will... Father, gain understanding of what you want us to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If we could get that full screen, that would be really nice. Um, So maybe you guys can work on that. Let's look at Mark chapter 8, and I'll read it to you. In those days when, again, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground He took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away, and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmuthia. Now, how many of you know that this is a familiar story that we just went through about three weeks ago? Uh, might have been three weeks. It might have been a month between Jesus and the disciples experienced this. We know that he fed how many previously? 5,000. Why in the world would they question if he could feed four? Right? Now, Jesus is going to test their sight, their vision, their heart, as to how much they've learned. And I want to just do a comparison between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. You'll notice that there's a difference between these two stories. And we'll get into it as Mark continues. But one of the things he says is this. They had five loaves and two fishes when he fed the 5,000. The 5,000 that he fed were Israelites. They were Jews. They were right? The children's bread. And so he fed 5,000 Israelites. You'll remember that it was on the very first day that the disciples were concerned for the people gathered there. They said, Jesus, it's getting late. We're concerned that these folks have nothing to eat. Can you send them home to get something to eat? And so their concern, the disciples about their own people, came forward. And uh, when they fed them, Jesus answered them by saying, you feed them. How many loaves of bread? They had five loaves, two two fish, and they distributed it, they ate it, and how many baskets full did they retrieve? Twelve, right, it's right up there. You've got a good memory. Twelve baskets. Now this is interesting to Israel. Twelve is the number of God's government, all right, and uh, five is for disciples, and so we see that this is important. Now, We're in a Gentile nation, we're in another region, and I find it interesting that uh, there are 4,000 Gentiles there. But don't you find it interesting that no one said anything about food for how many days? Three days. And the disciples didn't ask him, what are you going to do about these folks? Jesus had compassion on the crowd and said, we need to feed these people. And it just kind of shows me the lack of concern that the disciples had for Gentiles. Three days, they're not eating, I don't care. The other one, they were there, what, eight hours? We need food for our people. Three days, they got nothing to say about these Gentile people. Then, how many loaves do you have? Seven loaves. Now, let's do the math here. Ancient Hebrew, modern 
Math doesn't change. You got 5,000, five loaves, right? We saw this happen. This is good. Okay. We got 4,000, we got seven loaves. Now, I'm thinking you could feed 7,000 people. Five feeds 5,000, right? He asks him, what do you got? Seven loaves. How are we going to feed these people? They couldn't do the spiritual math, could they? Jesus plus any number works. Jesus plus any number changes the math. Jesus plus anything will get you what is necessary and what you need. Amen? Amen. Jesus concerned. Now, how many baskets did they bring back? Seven, the number of perfection in God. And so it's an interesting situation here. He puts it before them. And now he goes on in verse 11 and he says this, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, do you get that? They wanted a sign so that they could test the sign. They didn't want a sign to go, ooh, maybe he's the Messiah. They wanted a sign to argue. It's not good enough. That's not strong enough. That's not proof enough. They wanted a sign so that they could argue against it and test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. Oy vey, these people. Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Say it with me. No sign will be given to this generation. So that tells me something we cannot pass up. You can't go past this. So every healing, every provision of food, every deliverance from a demon, was that a sign to this generation? No, it wasn't. He just said, no sign will be given. Did I read this wrong? Sorry, I didn't mean to yell at you. (laughs) Let me repeat that. Jesus emphatically said, no sign shall be given to this generation. But he healed the sick, right? Cleansed the leper, fed many people. Were those signs to prove who he was? No. We think they were, but they're not. Think about it for a minute. Who were they for then? What? Nope. Huh? The disciples. He wasn't going to give a sign. He said, there's one sign I'm going to give to Israel to prove who I am. I'll read it to you. I truly say no sign will be given to this generation. And in Matthew, he says that there's only one sign he's going to give. Do you know what that sign was? The sign of Jonah. It's the resurrection. It's the only sign to Israel approving he's the Son of God. He said, only as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. That's the only sign he was going to give to prove or validate who he was. So I have to ask, what were all these other things for? We're considering that they were all to prove who he was when he himself just said, I am not going to give a sign for any kind of proof or evidence of who I am. These are not signs. Therefore, you must ask yourself, why did Rabbi Jesus feed 5,000? Why did Rabbi Jesus feed 4,000? Why did Rabbi Jesus heal the blind? Why did Rabbi Jesus uh, cast out demons? Why? For whose sake? His disciples. He's teaching his disciples what? Oh, I got you people all messed up today. You just you're afraid to answer. You don't want to consider this for brothers and sisters. We've been reading this thing wrong. We've been looking at all the proof and evidence of who Jesus says he's going to be as as all these things are proving he's the Messiah. What if I told you he was doing all of them so that you would do them too? The Gospel of Mark is a primer for disciples. We're reading it wrong. We're reading it wrong. We've been doing it wrong. All we keep saying, well, Jesus proved Jesus. He's doing all of this for his disciples to learn how to do it too. 
I'm not going to give you a sign to prove anything about me, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Remember, let's go back. Let's go back to what the reason a rabbi has disciples. The reason a rabbi takes disciples, 12, is so that he would train the disciples to do what he does. And so he's doing all of these things. Don't you remember? He sent them out into the cities. Now cast out demons and heal the sick. Remember he told them while they're in the boat and the wind and the waves come and they're going, oh no, we're going to die. And remember he gets in the boat and he says, didn't you learn from the feeding of the 5,000? Let me bring my point home. You're still a little leery. So he's, he's upset with the, the Pharisees because they want a sign. He says, I'm not going to give you any signs. I'm done with giving signs. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. That's just funny. That's just silly. How many baskets extra did they have? Seven. Yeah, they forgot to bring one. They had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Can Jesus do something with one loaf? There's only 12 with him, it's 13. Okay, one loaf of bread, 13 people. And he cautioned them, saying this. Now he's going to teach them. Watch out, or beware of the bread, or the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of Herod. So now he's turning this into a teaching moment. We've had bread on our minds, bread multiplying in the fields, right? Bread's a good, good uh, analogy to use here. And he says, beware of the bread, of what you eat, of the Pharisees and of Herod. Beware of these people. They have no faith. They have no trust. They want signs. Beware of the bread. And what's their response? Hey, Peter, did you bring any bread? No. Well, I think the master's mad. He's talking about bread. Thomas, do you have bread? I don't have any bread. We're going to (laughs) die. What are we going to do? They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Jesus is trying to teach them, and they're going, we don't have any bread. I'm getting hungry. Do you have any bread? I don't have. We have one loaf of bread. How are we going to split that up? I don't know. What do you think we should do? Wow. And they began discussing it. And Jesus was aware of this. And he said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for 5,000 How many baskets of broken pieces did you pick up? Uh, uh, 12. Okay. And now, the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you pick up? Uh, That would be seven. Okay. Do you not understand? I don't think I'm reading into this. I think I'm reading it with a little frustration. So immediately when he's trying to teach them of their lack, teach them of their need, what does he remind them of? Look, guys, you you got, what are you talking about how much bread you have? What's the inference here? What's he trying to get them to comprehend? When they were in a storm on the water, what did he want them to get? You can have authority over these wind and waves. Remember, he had already previously rebuked the wind and the waves. This time, he's just wave walking past them. Do you remember the second time? He's like, hey, fellas, what's up? And he's moving on. And they said, we're going to die. And he said, come on, don't you remember the feeding of the 5,000? What's the inference here? He's trying to teach them to understand the power of the kingdom of heaven. Now we feed 4,000, we're back in the boat, and they only have one loaf of bread, and they're worried about it. What's he say? Come on, guys, how many extra baskets did you have when I was there? Twelve? How many with this last time? It happened five minutes ago. Oh, that's seven. Yeah. What don't you understand? 
Now, we're not talking to people who watched the event. We're talking to the people who multiplied the bread in the event. Do you remember Jesus said, you feed them. Jesus didn't go, whammy, whammy, salami, whammy, and the bread multiplied. If he said that, you probably had salami with it. They were to take it and put it before the people. It was happening in their hands. It was happening with them. The church has become spectators to God instead of being the hands and feet of Jesus. We're the sign of who he is. We're the visible representation of an invisible God. We're the substance of things hoped for. We're the evidence of things not seen. We've forgotten that. And we're worried. What are we going to do? I've only got one loaf of bread. Pray. Command. Use authority. We've got to find our way back into the gospel of Mark today. Many will say, well... I don't know, I looked at church history, that doesn't happen. It hasn't, and it may have been lost, but I want to be the generation that finds it again. If we're close to the end, we need this kind of power. How about you? How about you? Call it wishful thinking? I don't think so. I call it a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I'm going back to my point. If Jesus said, I am not going to give any sign to this generation, then what was all the miracles about that he did? It was not a sign to prove who he was. It was teaching his people to do the same. You don't have to agree with me. But when you're sick, call me. When you need help, call those who trust and believe that. And we're going to pray our hearts out. And we're going to pray and lay hands on the sick. And we're going to see God do something. And sometimes we see him do something we didn't expect. Sometimes he does things that we want better. I don't know, but I'm just going to keep praying. And I'm following this gospel instead of your opinion. He tests the best. So he's testing us. You're his disciple. He considers you the best thing he's got on planet earth. So he's going to challenge you. Now look at what he said to his disciples when they were worried about having only one loaf of bread in the boat. He said this. He asked them three questions. Are your hearts hardened? In other words, are your hearts cold to spiritual realities, spiritual truths, to what this word says? Has your heart heart become hardened to, to disbelieve that Jesus will do what he said he will do? Are you fully persuaded that God is able to do what he said he'd do? Or has your heart become hardened? Heart, I'm messing it all up. Your heart has become hardened. Work with me here. And, and I don't know about you, but I've, I've got areas in my heart that I, I, I haven't believed as I should have. Because of some experience or something else. Second question, he says, do you have eyes but you fail to see? Do you have ears and you fail to hear? What's he referring to? He just fed 4,000 people. Didn't you see that? Hello? Hello, Peter? Hello? Didn't you see that? Hey, Peter, remember when the bread was in your hand and then you had two pieces in your hand? Did you see that and not see it? Did you hear it? How many sermons have we heard, people? How many sermons have you and I heard in our lifetime? I'm 55 years old. I've been in the church all my life. I've heard a lot of sermons. But I'll tell you what. He could ask me, have you heard this, but you don't see it? I'd have to say, yeah, I'm sorry, Lord. You're right. How many times have you read the Word of God? How many sermons have you heard on tapes and cassettes and on radios and on TV, but yet still we don't see the treasure within them? We hear, but we're not listening. And last of all, he says, don't you remember? Let me ask you something. Did Jesus touch your life at some point in your history? Did he? Did he? don't you remember how he's heard and listened to you? Don't you remember how he's talked to you? Don't you remember how he's cared for you? Don't you remember how your body, you, you felt the ministry of God's spirit in your life? 
Don't you remember when you prayed and you saw an answer? Don't you remember? So these are the things. Do you still not understand? That's the question of the hour. This goes directly in relation to why he feeds 5,000, why he heals the sick, why he heals the lame. Do you still not understand now that question begs an answer we shouldn't look into it what what should they understand huh? what is he expecting them to <coughs> understand their disciples of the Son of God. Paul got it. You know what Paul said? Paul said this, My God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God will supply all our needs through Christ Jesus. Every promise God has ever made is yes in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we're going to reach the end of this gospel in Mark, and he's going to give you the following things that will accompany the disciples of Jesus. They shall what? Lay hands on the sick. Turn to Mark 16 if you don't know it. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall cast out demons. Does that make sense as a summary of a primer of what he's teaching them to do? In conclusion, this is what you do. So what did he want them to understand? They still don't get it. You can walk on water, Peter. You can feed 5,000. You can heal the sick. You can uh, release captive who, uh, to demons. You can do these things in my name. Oh God, I'm preaching a strange gospel to a strange church, not you. The entire church of the 21st century. We don't get this. We've milked all of that out and we say, I hope we can get people to come to our Sunday service for a half hour and have coffee with us. God, what's happened to the gospel? It's neutered and it's bland. It's cheap. We've made it a philosophy. It doesn't even impact our society anymore. We're just a nuisance. We're a bug people step on. I'm a little worked up. But he tests the best. He tests the best. We're to become these people. We're to follow these. Now let's go on. Don't you understand yet? Let's, let's see what he does now to help him understand. Mark tells us the next story. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he said, Do you see anything? Now Jesus, again, you know, we looked at this last week. We realized that in Judaism, ancient Judaism, they believed that an anointed rabbi, even his saliva could heal people. Jesus is pretty radical. He says, come here, I'll heal you. <laughs> Spit right in his eye. Wow, okay. And then he says, can you see? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. He opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home. And he said, don't enter the village. Now, it's interesting that Mark would use this story right after that question of don't you get it yet? And he tells of how Jesus is opening the eyes of the blind. Wasn't that one of the questions? Do you see, but you cannot see and comprehend? The disciples, like us, were just like this man. Jesus has touched our lives, but we still only see fuzzy. We can't see. Touch me again, Lord. I see images of people, but they look like trees. In other words... Uh, the, the, he couldn't de de designate shapes. It was still unclear. And so this is what Jesus is doing with his apostles, with his disciples. He's getting them to see this revelation of who he is and who they're becoming. And uh, so as he's doing this, they're, 
vision is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer. And I pray for us today that we would say, Jesus, I, I see you. I hear your word, but it's, it's a little fuzzy for me right now. Touch me again. Touch me again. How many of you need a clearer revelation of who he is and who you are? We're messing with things of the world. We're playing games with the things of the world. Come on. We're addicted to the things of this world. We're setting the patterns of our lives and the clocks of our lives around this world. I know you got to go to work. Don't go late and say, well, I have a spiritual discernment that I don't have to be here on time. Don't do that. But you know what I'm saying? Come on, the world's invaded us too much. And so... He touches the man's eyes so that he could see again. And this is what he wants to do with his church. The church understands salvation. Thank God for the Reformation. Almost lost it there in the Dark Ages, didn't we? Now we got it back, but you know, with the Reformation and Reformed doctrine, they, they don't want to accept the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want the full gospel. How about you? I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I don't want to be a disciple of Calvin or a disciple of Edwards or a disciple of Luther or a disciple of MacArthur or a disciple of Copeland or a disciple... Of, I ain't following any of those guys. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I don't need to read the bestseller list on how to heal people. I've got the manual right here. This book of Mark, if, you can, if you'll get into it and understand, story after story he's saying, this is what you do. That's how you do it. Do this. Do that. Isn't it interesting? There's nothing fancy about it. Well, you need to eat only carbs for seven hours. Then you need to... The, the, he just says, put your hand on the man and pray. But nothing happens, Jesus. I've done that. Do it again. You're not seeing clearly. Do it again. And I'm going to work with you, and I'm going to test the best. The best are those who will follow him anywhere. And he'll test you, as he did his disciples. So we're going to take a test this morning. Okay? And here's our test. Number one, the same three questions. How hard is your heart? I'm not here to call anybody out except Magpie. I, I, I don't, how hard is your heart? This isn't about who's better than someone else, not at all. But you have to ask the question, how long have I been following Jesus and still I don't obey? He's getting his church ready. He's getting his people ready. He's going to test the best. He's going to test us. So he's asking you, how hard is your heart? Now he's going to have you do a, 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 an EKG right? And I'm trying to think of a fancy little thing for EKG. I'll have to do that between services. I got nothing right now. <laughs> How hard is your heart? I want you to pray right now. Let's take a minute now and just ask the Lord, Lord, where is my heart hard? Where do I trust myself instead of you? Where am I lacking in my faith in my inner man? And he asked the question after each one, do you not understand do you still not understand so i'm going to ask this pray this with me dear jesus, dear jesus touch, me again. touch me again soften my heart, soften my heart. To, you. to you amen next question here's your next question on your test spiritual blindness you see but you don't comprehend you hear but you don't understand are you seeing and hearing but not in the spirit our eyes are flooded with imagery. Our eyes see everything round about us. We see news on the other side of the planet instantly. But do you see the news of heaven? Do you see and hear the voice of the Lord for today, what He's doing, what He wants to accomplish? So let's pray. Pray this with me. Dear Jesus, touch my spiritual eyes once again. Give me ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. I don't want to be blind, and I don't want to be deaf to the things of God. Do you still not understand, he said. Now, he asked the third question. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? 
God has touched everyone in here. I, I have to believe that even if there's unbelievers here, people who have not accepted the Lord as their Savior, the reason you're here is because God brought you here. He's already touched you. Amen. Folks, we remember, we, we forget too quickly how faithful God was and how faithful He is. We forgot. You, you're not remembering what He did for you. How many of you remember that old hymn? Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Right? Needs a tuba. Oompa, 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 tita, tita. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? God does things in space and time and your life and in history so that you've got something to hold on to. That's why He wants you to get baptized publicly so you can hold on and declare, I have declared Him as my Savior. That's why He wants you to have experiences in prayer. He wants you to see and hear and understand and know and your heart soft to Him so you'll remember all the things He did for you. So let us pray. Father God, Ask, ask him, Father God, Amen. remind me today, remind today of, all the blessings of all the blessings that you have given me. That you have given me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit bring, to my mind bring to my mind all the things, all the things that you have done for me. That you have done for me. Amen. Amen. And I close with this this morning. All that Jesus did in this book was to teach his disciples how to be a light in a dark world, how to be the salt of the earth, and how to go and do likewise. We are in this world as he is, John says. Let us be that light. Remember When your faith in God is like a trusting child You believe that he could do just anything Remember Try to picture it in your mind all the joy you felt the first you came to find that Jesus loved you enough to die for you. Remember.